Hey, Stacy David here, and this is the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals since 1919. That's right, over 100 years building tools and still going strong. If you need tools, check them out. You won't be disappointed. All right, let's get rolling. All right, as the weather's starting to get a little nicer, the car show season starts to roll around. And, man, that's always a great time to get out and check out some stuff. Now, I know a lot of you guys might be going, ah, man, car shows, I don't go to those. It's just a bunch of people sitting around. Well, you're going to the wrong shows then because you need to get out and have some fun with your car. And the thing is, even if people are just sitting around, they're still car people. So it's great to get out, make some new friends, and just share the camaraderie that car people have. Now, we just got back from one. We went out to Pomona to the Grand National Roadster Show. Now, listen, if you haven't been to that, you need to put it on your list as something that you need to do, one of those bucket list things. I've been wanting to get out there to the Roadster Show for years, decades, and it just never worked out. You know, it comes this time of year, which is, if you're listening to this, we're shooting this in February. So, you know, that's right after the holidays, and it's right after SEMA, and it's usually our real heavy shooting time. So it just never worked out for me to be able to get out to the Grand National Roadster Show. Well, we finally did. We went out there. We had Copperhead out there in the Keep On Trucking exhibit, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But, man, the Roadster Show, it was just cool. Such a great venue. You know, you had trees. You had cars around. The weather was perfect. And it was just such a cool car culture. Now, what I mean by that is usually when you go to a show, you know, people are creatures of habit. (laughs) And we just are. And the best thing you can do is try to break out of that in anything that you do, whether it's the music you like or the food you eat or the friends you hang with. In this case, we're talking about like the cars. You know, generally Corvette guys will stick around other Corvette guys, and Mustang guys will gravitate to Mustang guys, and and the street rod guys will hang together, and the Volkswagen guys will be over in a corner, and the, you know the lowrider guys will be over in the infield, you know, and that kind of thing. And if you're not getting around and seeing the other cars, you're you're just you're missing out. You just really are, because car people are car people, no matter what they're driving. It gives you a chance to see other types of builds, maybe get some different ideas, maybe expand your horizons and go into a different type of uh, vehicle the next time. For example, out at GNRS, you know, you've got the, of course, the Amber Award, America's Most Beautiful Roadster. I mean, that goes back to like 1950. So there's a ton of history there. And these cars are the best of the best, but they're all roadsters. So it's usually, you know, obviously a mid-30s car that you're seeing. But then they also have the Al Sloniker Award, which is their version of the Riddler. Now, if you're not familiar with that kind of award, this is the creme de la creme, the best of the best that you can do to a custom vehicle. And instead of being a roadster or something that's a, a 30s vehicle, it can be anything. I mean, there were, there were 30s cars, there were coupes, there were uh, roadsters, there, there were 60s cars, there were 50s cars. You know, there were just all kinds of great stuff. The one that won was a Buick Invicta that Andy Leach built. Oh, my gosh. This was a nine-year build. And I asked Andy how many hours he had, and he goes, (laughs) he looked at me and he goes, well, how many hours are in nine years? So you just do the math on that one. Yeah, that's, we're talking seven figures way deep. But, you know, it is, it's great to see workmanship at that level. You know, and, and there's a lot of people that walk around a car like that. It's, it's beyond what most people can even conceive what they're looking at. So some people go, well, you know, you can't drive it. You can't. It's like, that's not really the point of those sort of cars, but you can take away something from that. Over in another area are the drivers. For example, we were leaving that night. A guy pulls up and he's in a 65, you know, El Camino with a blown Arius Hemi in it with a four-speed and you know, gutted pipes, and he comes rumbling by, and it was just awesome. (laughs) It was like a car I remember when I was in high school. So you have all of this stuff going on, and most shows are like that. So, man, I encourage you to get out there and and see these kind of things. Go to the Grand National Roadster Show if you get a chance. 
Uh, the keep on trucking display was awesome. You know, uh, obviously you had uh, they had Copperhead there, but there was Billy Gibbons uh, El Camino right there beside it. You had one of Fusa's vehicles. Um, you had all of these vehicles that had been trend setting or uh, very influential over the years, and then you had all these cool vans. I mean, and it's it's so cool to see the vans coming back and being popular. Everybody loves those things, you know. So. Uh, they had the Suede Palace, which, of course, is more of your kind of traditional cars, your, you know, your rat rod kind of thing. Nobody really uses that term as much anymore. But anyway, so, you know, these kind of these kind of shows, man, if you get a chance to get out there, don't miss out on them. Because if you're doing this car thing by yourself, man, that's a lonely existence. You, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, car guys and girls, you know, we want to share what we're doing with somebody that has a like mind and a like mindset. So I encourage you to get out there. When I first started, I would build my own engines. Man, I haven't built my own engine in decades because, you know, you know, I'd rather have John Cossey do it or and you know, and he's got that's what he does. Or, you know, there's great crate engines out there and, you know, so we will take an engine and put parts on it and stuff like that, but that's how you utilize, you know, this industry to help get your vehicle done you know back when it kind of started you know when i started building cars there wasn't that network so you had to kind of do everything and it took forever but that was fine you know but then as the aftermarket started coming in they started coming out with products that made it easier for us to get this stuff done for example do you guys remember you know when you first started working on this let's say an old chevy truck from the 50s well, you pretty much just had to leave the suspension the way it was. And then people came out with disc brake conversions. So you'd stick disc brakes on those things. And they still handled like crap, but at least they stopped a little better. And then some companies came out with a front subframe. You know, that was kind of like you, know, you were going out in the junkyards and cutting out subframes out of Plymouth Volares or Novas or whatever and trying to graph those on there because that's what you had. But then, you know, guys like Fat Man or Heights or TCI, you know, they came out with these frame stubs and front suspensions. So it made it so much easier to get a safe suspension underneath the front or the rear. Well, that has slowly moved forward. Now you can get complete frames. You know, now you can go back and do it the old way. You can keep all that other stuff is still available, all those other steps. So you can kind of decide how you want to put your vehicle together. But keep in mind, all of this aftermarket stuff is there to make it easier for us. So make sure you're utilizing that as you're building your project. It's there to, uh, to help you out. And, and build those friends, man. <laughs> we were out there, and uh, I was doing uh, some interviews uh, with some of my buddies for an upcoming show. And I ran into Tim Strange. You know, I've known Tim for a long time. He's a hoot. And it was Steve Mank. Oh, my gosh. Steve Mank is, jeez. He just makes me laugh. If I would have gone to school with Steve Mank, we'd all still be in jail. And then Troy Ladd, man, what a builder he is. And funny, oh, we got some great bites from him. Like I said, Andy Leach had a chance to talk with him. His car won, so we got a whole story coming up on that. Ron Covell, I ran into him. Uh, we put Ron on TV 20 years ago when I was doing trucks. And uh, what a phenomenal guy, phenomenal metal worker. Ran into Brian Brennan, you know, the legend in the uh, magazine world, and uh, talked to him some about the new magazine they've got. So it's just great to go out there. Uh, if you get a chance, you need to check it out. You know, when gearheads get together, it isn't long until the subject of tools comes up. Because tools are what make all this possible. You guys know that. And car guys and girls are passionate about tools. What's good and what is bad. And that is one thing that I have to give Cornwell a lot of credit for. They'll listen to what the pros are saying about their tools and constantly make changes to build them better. That's why they have new screwdriver handles and ratchets and all kinds of other stuff coming out all the time. It's not just to get your money, which a lot of people think. It's the never-ending quest to build a better tool. Because Cornwall knows that if you're not working and getting paid, they're not getting paid. <laughs> That's why they're America's oldest tool company and still going strong. Check them out.
Okay, the next question comes from Chet. Chet says, hey man, I have a 93 GMC Sierra with a 4.3 V6. And he said, I was looking to swap in a, a Vortec 5.7 V8. A friend told me to do twin turbos. He said, but really, his 93 is stock from the factory, and it only gets 12 miles to gallon. And he really wants to improve the mileage. So that's why he was looking at a turbo. And he says, now, will a turbo do this? Will it make it possible? And he said, it may not be cheaper, but it will be easier from his point of view than doing a V8 swap. Now, this is the important thing. He says, this is going to be a grocery getter and to do some light towing. He says, I do understand that the performance will be much better, but will it improve MPG? Okay. Uh, really good question, Chad. A lot of things going on here. Let's kind of dig into this a little bit. First of all, let me just kind of explain for everybody that's kind of listening uh, basically what a turbo is doing. Just like a supercharger, it takes oxygen and compresses it, and it's basically overloading your cylinders with oxygen. It's what nitrous does from a chemical standpoint turbos and superchargers do from a mechanical standpoint. Okay, so you're, it, the idea is jamming more oxygen into your engine. It does that with the hope that you're going to be jamming more fuel in there as well to give you more power. So turbos aren't necessarily for better mileage. <laughs> now they can be. What it can do is it can up the efficiency if you don't have your foot in it. Because what it's doing is compressing more air and it's making the fuel you're using more efficient. So there can be a little bit of benefit in mileage with a turbo as long as you keep your foot out of it. Now there is the rub because you got the turbo, you don't want to keep your foot out of it, so you stomp it. Now keep in mind when you stomp it, you're ramming more fuel and more oxygen into the engine. The engine's going crazy. So that mileage is going to go down <laughs> big time because you're, you're really jumping onto it. Also, uh, if your 4.3 is stock, I would not put twin turbos on by any means. You know, that, that engine is only going to be able to handle so much. You say the performance is going to be much better. Well, I don't know what you mean by much. It will be better. But I tell you what, dropping a V8 in that thing, especially an LS, is going to be a world different than that little V6, even with a turbo. My suggestion, there's so many kits out there now to drop a, a, an LS into that truck. Uh, I would do the LS swap because an LS, you know, it's not impossible to get over 20 miles to the gallon out of an LS you know, driving it down the road and driving it. And you're going to have the torque to do the light towing that you're going to do, um, being a grocery getter. Personally, I would suggest you do the, the motor swap. Uh, everything that you need to do that is right there in the Holly catalog. You know, motor mounts, headers, the whole thing. And by the time you stick a turbo system on there, plumb it outright and get all that, I think in the long run, you're going to go, ah, I wish I'd have had a V8. <laughs> now, a V8 with the turbo on it or twin turbos, now you're talking. <laughs> uh, but that's going to take it, you know, down a, a whole different road. But you, it'll be a fun road to go. But anyway, the 4.3 V6 is a good engine. But I think for what you want to do, uh, my suggestion would be to put a V8 in there. Hope that works for you, Chad. Good luck to you, man. Well, I noticed that my buddy Vaughn Hot Rod was down at the World of Wheels in Chattanooga this last weekend. And uh, I've known Vaughn Hot Rod for a long time. And if you have not experienced Vaughn Hot Rod, well, you need to, man. He's at car shows all the time. He is a pinstriper extraordinaire. He is also a great car builder himself. And he's a heck of a drummer. We actually got him on the drums one time here at the shop and had him play Wipeout. <laughs> And he actually hung really well with it. I was surprised. You don't just throw wipe at it, just anybody. And, and Vaughn jumped right in there. And, uh, you know, the cool thing about Vaughn is that he is so pro car. I mean, he, he is so good about the industry. He's a great guy. 
and uh, very, very talented, and he will pinstripe anything, almost anything. There's been a few things he's had to draw the line on when people were wanting him to pinstripe body parts. We had him do some stuff one time. I don't know if you have seen the Rat Roaster guitar. If you haven't, you know, I, I do custom guitars with all of the big projects, and the Rat Roaster guitar was one that I went to Gibson with. The Rat Roaster obviously was a 32 Ford Roadster that I did in a late 60s style. So I wanted the, the guitar that went with it. It had to be kind of this rockabilly machine. So it had to be a Gibson 335. So I got with Gibson. I went down there to the custom shop. And they're like, well, you want to do a 335, huh? He says, go ahead, grab him one of those 335s over there. So they grabbed me a 335 custom that was, it had a blemish in the back. So they were getting ready to saw it in half which is one of the things that, that Gibson does. If they have one that doesn't meet the criteria, they don't refurbish it. They just destroy it. So I, I've got this 335 Custom that, you know, was, it wasn't finished out, didn't have the finish on it or anything. And he said, take that thing, do whatever you want to it. He said, then we'll finish it out as far as put the pickups and, and all that stuff on it. So I took it home. I cut off one of the, the lower horn and I put an exhaust system out of stainless steel coming out of the bottom of the, of the guitar. And it's really cool. I mean, the, it's got this pipe hanging out of it. The guitar went together. It's painted the same color that the car was. But it was missing that magic element. And that magic element was pinstriping. And I wanted somebody on there that was, you know, that had a little bit of historical value uh, himself. And Von Hot Rod was the perfect guy to do it, especially since he was a music guy too. So we had him come in, and he laid some pinstriping down and it's great. It just makes the guitar. You know, he picked the right color to accent it. You know, we just we shot this on the show. We just had a great time with him. And then, just in passing, you know, with pinstripers, the big uh, thing that they always, you know, their point of pride is how small can they sign something or how little can they pinstripe something because it's all about the tiny details. So... You know, we were talking about that, and I said, okay, Vaughn, I got something for you. Now, we had done a model with Ravel of the Rat Roaster car, and in the kit, there's also a scale model of the guitar. So now this guitar is literally probably two inches tall, and it is the 335 with the exhaust and all that stuff, and it had been painted up by the guy that had actually built the model for the cover of the box. I have that model kit. So I took that little guitar, and keep in mind it's two inches tall. At the most, it might be an inch and a half tall. And I said, Vaughn, there you go. You need to pinstripe that guitar like you did the other one. <laughs> it's impossible. And that crazy Vaughn, I, th I swear he took one hair out of, the, out of one of his brushes, and he got a little stripe on there that is like what's on the guitar. I mean, you can hold it up there, and you can see... It actually mimics what was on the guitar. And it was we laughed about that. Just a great guy. So if you're out at a show, you get a chance to, to see Von Hot Rod. Take him over a shoe or a air cleaner or a glove box door or just something. Have him pinstrap it for you. And uh, tell him I said howdy. You'll have a good time with Vaughn. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Make sure that you check out the... Uh, gears tv website we got all kinds of cool stuff there we got a couple new die casts coming out got some books coming out uh, we have all kinds of things going on but the most important thing is get out there and turn some wrenches yourself get a project if you don't have one start working on it and if you don't have tools check out cornwell they can help you out there also don't forget to check out gears on gears nation amazon mav tv and motor trend all right, we'll see you down the road.